Thank you. Good evening to everyone and thank you for being here. Thank you for to the organizer for such a great event and thank you for all, to all the people who talked before me because it was really a great content. So thank you so much. Stay with me at least for one hour. So I will, I hope to be at the same level of the other speakers. And I think I will show you something interesting to you. Okay. Let's start immediately. Oh, I, I bought this laser pointer two years ago. This is the first time I use it. It works. Okay. Great. So, okay. A couple of things about me before starting. My name is Cesare Pizzi. Uh, I work uh, as a security guy at Sorrent Lab, which is an Italian company, a pretty big one, uh, with some branch offices into, in all the, over the world. Uh, I would like to thank them for allowing me to work for them. And what I do there, it's a lot of things related to security, even if, uh, let's say, my first focus is reverse engineering. So we will speak about reverse engineering today as a main, uh, main focus. Uh, I, I'm really interested in, in everything related to security. I also contribute to several projects related to security, like volatility, open canary, C2s. Uh, I also have uh, some personal projects running, like CNWall, for example, which is a kind of a different way of thinking for walling for, for Linux systems. So you want to have a look. Uh, there is my GitHub here. I encourage you to go there and to tell me what you think about everything I do. But now today we are here to speak about Resploit. And uh, I don't even have an agenda here. <clears throat> Sorry. I just started from some random stuff about this project because uh, I started looking at my uh, daily job as a reverse engineer and actually realizing that uh, we have a lot of standard tools to help Red Teamer out there. I think that most of you know uh, uh, Metasploit or Cobalt Strike uh, tools, uh, frameworks. Uh, if not, uh, okay, they are really well done tools that helps attackers to build up their attack chain. And uh, okay, uh, they are so well done, that even attackers are using them. Uh, and that's an issue in some cases because uh, what I thought is that I don't have a counterpart of it. Uh, I don't have a tool that allows me to review that kind of payloads, that kind of uh, um, tricks and tools used by this framework to help me in and speed up at least as this speed up the attacker, uh, at, at least in the same way. And so I decided to try to do something like that. So try to build a tool to reverse what Metasploit and, and Cobalstike are doing very well. Uh, and the random tab number three was that uh, I'm sure that will be a mess in some way and I will regret this decision, but let's try to see together today if I did something which is helpful or not. Uh, again, uh, I love open source. Uh, I contribute pro to projects. Uh, I standing on the shoulder of giants as well here with my product uh, because uh, uh, I'm built it on two main pillars, which one of each is Unicorn Engine. Uh, probably most of you know what is it. It's an emulator of a CPU based on Kimu, which is another great project. And uh, what it does, it allows you to emulate CPUs on a given environment. And another pillar on which I built the tool itself, it's uh, a tool coming from Mandiant, which is named Speakeasy, which is a kind of uh, I, I would like to call it helper on Unicorn itself in order to emulate Windows payloads uh, in an easier way, let's say. And so um, the approach I thought with my tool was to actually initially focus myself on Windows Metasploit 32-bit uh, and 64-bit payloads. With, this was the original focus I got on the tool itself. Then I'm trying right now to evolve it in something more generic, adding several uh, other layers, support layers, because actually I built some support layers on other tool, because I built layers for Cobalt Strike, for Donuts, uh, and this has been done at two levels. One, it's exploit itself, so the tool itself implements some helpers, some fix-ups, and we will see them together, in, in order to be able to complete the emulation of these kind of payloads. The other one is, uh, my contribution is going also to the open source software because time to time when I'm trying to improve the tool, I build, for example, new API calls for Mandiant, Speakeasy, and so I 
have several pull requests uh, done, several pull requests with them. And so part of the code of Resploit, it's in some way also contributing other main projects uh, like the one I'm using. So I think that this is how open source should work. So I encourage you to do something like that. So maybe build your own project and give back to, to the community with your work. The basic idea uh, is that the two tools I'm using, so Unicorn Engine and Magnus Pekisi are actually generic tools. They are not built for specific payloads. And so if you try to use them out of the box, probably they are not working as you expect. And this is where Resploit comes in because it builds a set of uh, helpers, a set of harnesses around these tools to help you in complete the emulation and to being able to execute this in an environment that does allow you to extract also artifacts and so on. Basic operations are applied on binary files. So it is done on shell codes, XA and DLL. Everything is Windows based right now. I don't exclude that uh, it will be also moved to Linux in some way. And also uh, it's able also to analyze pickup files. So if you have in some way your network probe collecting um, data and generating network traffic, it can analyze as well. The interface itself, it's a CLI, it's a common CLI interface. Uh, I took this decision because it's uh, very easy to then use it and pipe outputs to uh, Unix commands to grab to output file and so on. So I based the work on a CMD2 interface, which is another great open source project. And what Resplit can do, it's automatically detect the payload format, for example, detect if it's a 64, 22 bits download uh, DLL, for, uh, sorry, or, or shell code, and then start up the emulation of the code. And depending on what it, it finds into the code itself, it's able to extract API calls, keys, uh, encryption keys, and artifacts based on uh, what we uh, may expect in a metal exploit or cobalt strike or whatever uh, we will add to it uh, payload. Okay, let's speak some, uh, some about some advantages and disadvantages of this, of this approach, because uh, uh, as I said, I'm using emulation, so I'm trying to emulate code. One of the point uh, and the great advantage of this approach is that uh, uh, static tools can be easily fooled by the, the obfuscation, encryption, and so on. So static tools that try to detect uh, artifacts or something like that uh, are usually fooled in a very easy way, but more or less 100% of the modern malware or malicious code because uh, everyone implements obfuscation, encryption, or something. So static tools sometimes does not work. Also, by emulating the code, we have a very great advantage because we are actually interacting with the code. So we can also uh, try to make the code follow some other branches and so modify a specific uh, way the, the code is getting, for example, I want to change uh, a value in a register that uh, will take another branch of the code. I can do it by emulating the code because I'm actually executing step by step uh, in an automatic way the whole payload. Also, this can be combined with uh, other reverse engineering tool probably. Uh, so it's not probably your only tool you will use, Resploit, but you will use it together with, I don't know, uh, IDA or Guide or Ghidra or uh, Radare2 or whatever you, you prefer. There are also some disadvantages on, on this approach. I'm not here to cheat you because emulation can be a fragile process. So remember that this is not a sandbox. So you don't have a complete uh, operating system behind. You have a kind of uh, a fake environment, let's call it this way. And this in some cases is actually not easy to, to manage because sometimes things are just breaking, but we can try to fix them. Emulation also can be slow. Uh, so it's not for sure something for running uh, uh, high um, code with uh, really high speed requirements. And also, uh, as all the tools you use in your daily job, this is a new one. You need probably to have a summer, um, you have a, to face a, lear a learning curve to, 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 to master it and to get the most out of it. So these are all the advantages and advantages we have. Let's go now and, and try to understand what actually uh, Resploit and, and its emulation feature can do. The tool is able to automatically detect uh, my, my, um, Metasploit framework and Cobalt Strike payloads. 
and can manage them and extract artifacts from, from them. Best of the results are seen with uh, position independent binaries. Uh, because as I said, this is not a sandbox. Uh, executables and DLS are emulated, but they have a bit, they are a bit more complex in some ways. So, uh, it works sometimes, but sometimes you have to, let's say, help the emulator itself in, in doing some uh, add-ons to, to, to have it uh, running uh, in the proper way. And, uh, as I said, the tool can emulate executable, can break sometimes. Sometimes it's an easy fix, sometimes not. Please, if you face something that you want to fix, uh, open an issue on GitHub. The tool is open source. It's already out. Uh, I released a new release uh, a couple of days ago. Uh, I will be more than happy to work with you on issues and so on to improve it together. So uh, that's uh, how I hoped it will, uh, it will uh, go ahead. So now let's start to make something more um, practical and say, okay, but what exactly is able to do this tool? Uh, let's start with the original focus of the tool itself, which was Metasploit payloads. Metasploit play payloads may fall under several different groups, uh, which are, for example, RC4 encrypted, uh, a less common cha cha um, encrypted shell, which has been probably released with Metasploit 5, uh, probably then removed, but it's out there. Uh, I saw it sometimes. Then there are, for example, encrypted interpreter shell, which is another very common uh, uh, artifact that uh, Metasploit can produce and many other. Let's have a look on how it works. Usually this is a, a, a flow of a usual Metasploit attack where you have something sending an exploit to the, the system itself uh, together with uh, a first stage uh, code. And uh, this is in some way tricking your application in executing this uh, this code. Then this code makes a callback to the C2, so the, the, the here, but it makes it by encrypting the, um, the communication, for example, with an RC4 algorithm, which uh, uh, is coming out from this payload uh, directly. And then it, the, 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 the attacks, it, be it begins with the, the, the effects done by the payload. So what uh, is able to do re-exploit in this case? It's able to follow this uh, exchange by emulating the code and extract some of the artifacts uh, out from uh, the uh, payload itself, allowing you to actually analyze in a very faster way what is happening uh, during the attack. So let's make a quick... Uh, demo and uh, let me show you what I'm speaking about. Okay, so this is the interface. As I said, it's a common CLI one. Uh, you have some commands available here. And the, the main one you will use, uh, it's the emulate payload, which is, uh, okay, this one. And the only things it needs, it's just a path to the uh, binary that you in some way got from the infected system or from uh, your pickup file or from tracked server and so on. So what happens here is that, okay, it starts the emulation. So the code, in this case, it's a shell code. It has been uh, emulated. And what you get out of the box immediately is, uh, okay, for example, all the API calls done uh, by the, the, the shell code itself. This is extremely interesting if you, interesting if you are analyzing it because it's, for example, show you which are the C2, which are the communication ports, and so on. This is coming out from Speakeasy emulation. But what Resplate in this case is doing is actually also doing a couple of other interesting things, which is extracting the XOR key used to encrypt the communication, and also extracting this one, which is the RC4 key used to encrypt the whole communication between the attacker and the, the victim. And, okay, what you can do with this key? Nothing. No, you can, for example, decrypt the second stage and getting it out from your pickup or something. Uh, you can do it manually or you can use, uh, as, as again, Resploit, doing exactly the same command. So uh, I'm still using the emulate payload with the same payloads here. So the same shellcode given at the, um, at the command line. Now I add a couple of things. One is the, uh, uh, the C2 IP I got out from the API. And another one is a, a pickup file I got from my, maybe my network probe or something like that. And restarting the emulation again. So what is happening is exactly, exactly as before, uh, all the code emulated here. 
the extraction of the keys and also another things. So, uh, Resplit itself is able to get the pickup file to locate the communication and extract and decrypt with the RC4 key the second stage. So in this case, uh, you can see that if you are used to analyzing these kind of things, this is a kind of uh, PE executable, uh, which has been previewed here and dumped into a specific file. So that means that in this case, I completely, I can get a complete analysis done in very few comments uh, with uh, the uh, tool itself. And this is done on specific on several of the payloads available in Metasploit. This is done on RC4, there is a ChaCha one uh, and several others available directly out of the box. Let's go back to the presentation again and let's speak about Meterpreter. I'm sure that probably most of you knows what a Meterpreter shell is. Uh, it's a, let's say, portable common way to uh, open a, a shell on a victim system done by the, um, the Metasploit framework. It is very Use of, uh, well done as well, and it's very used. What uh, happens, it's more or less as before. So um, you have, oops, sorry. You have uh, um, uh, an exploit sent with the, um, the payload itself. Then there is a callback done by the victim going through a default port, which is 444, for example, and so on. And then here is where something happens because there is an handshake because the communication of the interpreter shell is actually encrypted, but it's encrypted in a different way if we compare it with the RC4 than before. It's encrypted in a stronger way because it actually uses an AES key, which is in some way encrypted with an RSA public key. If this action of encrypting the AES key with the RSA public key given by the interpreter shell, okay, we can do so much with the communication itself because we cannot actually decrypt it and, and, and unless we have access to uh, the um, private key, but I think it's unlikely to have it. But uh, we still have a possibility. This is an interesting thing because uh, when the uh, actually the attack starts, uh, Metasploit starts tries to uh, import an RSA public key on the victim itself in order to encrypt the uh, uh, symmetric key. If in some way uh, this import for, uh, fails, it silences a fallback in another in another encryption uh, method, which is a just XORed key, and so Resploit can read it. That means that if you can in some way engage your attacker and so try to modify what he is doing in your system, you can actually force this uh, on your victim system and then being able to decrypt the whole communication between the two the, the two systems. How can do it? Uh, there is a very interesting article here uh, on POC and GTFO uh, done by Myers and Saltanek. I recommend to you to read it because it's very interesting. It says how to exploit weak shell code uh, hashes. Uh, I'm sure most of you knows that uh, usually malware use and position dependent code use uh, specific hashing in order to locate and use uh, um, API calls. They don't use directly the name, but they use a kind of hashing. This hashing can be in some way um, tricked to execute something different of what uh, uh, the metasploit, the, the, the payload itself wants to do it. And this is very well explained in this article. I suggest you to do, to have a look to it. Otherwise, you can just patch a byte in memory. This is coming from the example I did. So if you can locate your attacked system, you can just patch a jump equal into a jump not equal and then have this RSA encryption fails. Or you can use your preferred hook libraries like the tools or whatever you want just to uh, uh, trick the interpreter in falling back. And what happens in this case is this. So let's see the sample number three. Okay, so you have in this case to use a different command. It's not the emulate payload, but in case you have to use the interpreter traverse TCP command and just give the it just give it a pickup file where you actually store the whole communication of the analysis itself. Okay, 
Here you can see that it, can, it can dumps the RSA public key. It can identify that there is a um, interpreter uh, communication in the in the pickup file itself. And if you actually engage your attacker, you can also extract the AAS key from the pickup file and then decrypt the whole communication. These are the, the TLV commands, which uh, is the, the way an interpreter used to encode the communication, which are type length, uh, length value set of commands. Uh, and you can actually read the entire communication and get every command that has been run on the attacker by the attacker on the system itself with all the payloads and so on. So it uh, can decode because uh, by themselves the, the thing is because I just ported all the valid command directly from the uh, Metasploit project into Resploit. So it just works out of the box. Okay, let's go back into the presentation and let's I, I told you okay I focus my initial work on Metasploit but now Cobalt Strike it's becoming more and more common to be uh, and, and is a lot uh, seen a lot on uh, on in my real uh, real job um, so much that in some way we are running into a genetic bottleneck with attacker code and it's a pity because it's less interesting to see because there are a lot of attackers now migrating on Cobalt Strike uh, and so the support for Cobalt Strike is present and it's working needs improvement for sure also because Cobalt Strike is quite a complex beast to, to treat on uh, it can recognize the beacons uh, the cell so Resploit can recognize the beacon if uh, you can pass it and also it can decode the configuration. If uh, you have uh, a Cobalt Strike parser, which is a tool coming from uh, Sentinel-1 installed, it can use it automatically and dump the configuration. But as you probably know, Cobalt Strike can be used in a couple of ways. You can use the, let's say, out of the box function functionalities and configuration, which are more or less known, and you can actually decrypt the configuration and so on, but uh, you can also customize it a lot. Uh, so if uh, the attacker customized it, uh, probably the static tools, as I said before, are not going to work. So the extraction of the configuration does not work. But uh, as I said before, the emulation can uh, help us in this case because emulation does not rely on uh, uh, static things on the code, but it can just unroll the code and read it and uh, go ahead with the analysis. Here yeah, I'm making an example with a uh, Nibontet Epoch 5 sample, thanks to Malware Traffic Analysis for providing the sample. And uh, I can show you that, uh, for example, by just emulating the code, you can get some information out from the Cobalt Strike Beacon itself, which is, uh, uh, for example, the C2, the parameters used to, the con to establish the connection, and all the API calls done by the, by the executable itself. Uh, as I said, uh, beacons can be heavily customized uh, on Cobalt Strike. Uh, even the sleep mask, the sleep masks are the way that Cobalt Strike used to encrypt themselves in memory when he's sleeping. So uh, it cannot be detected by detection engine. Uh, but sleep sleep mask can be customized. So uh, usually, if you face one of them probably your detection engine will not work, but by emulating the code, you can also extract this kind of sleep masks from uh, from the beacon itself and try to understand what he's doing and doing your job on, the, on it. So uh, I will show you also a quick uh, sample of how it works, uh, even for Cobalt Strike. In this case, okay, I'm just emulating as with the usual command. In this case, I'm passing uh, also, another parameter, because this was a 64-bit beacon from Cobalt Strike. Okay, as you can see here, in this case, it recognized there was a configuration, so it used the the, um, the, Cobalt, Strike, the Cobalt Strike parser uh, utility installed to decode every single uh, parameter. But uh, even if we were in the case that uh, it was not possible, by emulating the code itself, here it takes a while because uh, actually Cobalt Strike is... Uh, kind of uh, uh, a bit more complex than uh, the Metasploit and he's doing a lot of things. Uh, but uh, you will see that, okay, it's now decoding all the queue, all the API calls. And as before, you can just analyze them and may figure out what actually your beacon is doing uh, in your system. So you can 
uh, as before, you are getting your C2, your cookie set, your way of contacting the C2 and so on. So uh, it can, uh, it allows you to uh, make your an idea of what actually the binary you are finding around it's doing, what it's doing. So, uh, as I said, uh, Risploit uh, enhance emulation uh, because, as I said before, sometimes uh, uh, if you just get the tools I, I was referring before, so Unicorn and Mandiant, Speakeasy, they break if you try to emulate things uh, because uh, I had to face uh, several issues in getting these things running like uh, I show you just, just now. Uh, and this is done through the fix-ups. Uh, fix up must be uh, manually enabled in the, in the tool itself. So it requ they requires a dash F uh, option and they try to fix things because let me make you an example here. Um, this is, I, I realized this when I was working with Shikata Ganai um, encoded samples from Metasploit. You probably know that Shikata Ganai is a well known uh, encoding engine and uh, Unicorn when it's trying to emulate that code it's failing because in some way there is an, some instruction executed twice. In any case, the, the execution itself is not reliable. There is an open issue on that, which will probably never fix it because it's come, it's something that it comes out from the Kimu um, engine. And it's due to the fact that uh, Shikata Ganai tried to uh, self-modify code in the same translated block. So between the six, the first 16 bytes from the program counter. That means uh, that it's in some way, probably uh, something that was not taken into consideration for the emulation and it, it just breaks. So what I did, it's uh, just implementing this uh, fix ups manually in the code of Resploit and executing the code by myself and then overcome to this, to this problem. Uh, another example of fix ups is, for example, the emulations of, of uh, uh, the floating point instructions because uh, if you are used to position independent code, you know that floating point instructions are often used to locate the, the executable in the memory. And uh, floating point instructions emulated are not behaving consistently as well. To tell the truth, they are not behaving consistently even if you are debugging them. You, I don't know if you ever debugged uh, these kind of things in both Linux and Unix. Uh, if you are single stepping this instruction with a debugger, you are probably going to get uh, some strange values out of them. So if you execute them in a block, it works. I don't know if it's a problem, it's the same as them with the emulator, but in, even in this case, I had to apply a manual fix on this kind of emulation to get it working. Another example of fix ups implemented in Resploit is that for some reason, some of the engine I implemented were failing because the stack of the emulation code was too small. And so I had to put some uh, fake values there to, in order to make the, the, the stack a bit bigger and uh, being able to complete the emulation itself. Then I said that I'm trying to move it on a more generic approach. And so I had added additional support for other tools used by, by attackers or by, uh, let's say, teamer in some, in some cases. One is Danat. Danat, it's a well-known utility. Probably you know it. It's uh, used to create position independent code out of an executable. If you give your executable to Danat, it will just translate it in a position independent code. So you can get it and virtual allocking uh, it to some, somewhere. Uh, but Danat, it's based on a well-known stub, so it can be detected. And uh, there was a strange thing done by Danat. Not a strange one. It's uh, very common, to be honest because he was using uh, the usual API hashing way to call APIs, but in some way was slowing down a lot the execution in the emulated environment. So what I did is to implement here a shortcut for uh, donut specifically. So when the donut tab is detected in memory, there is a kind of shortcut in order to overcome to this uh, uh, part here and then make the emulation faster and complete it uh, very fast. So, this is another example of donut, uh, of uh, fix up applied on donut because for some reason there was these API calls failing in, uh, in the emulator itself. It was a map view exception, which was in some way, uh, correctly used with the read write command, a read write flag here in order to write it. But for some reason, Unicorn was failing. In this case, probably more um, speakeasy when accessing and writing. 
uh, I do, didn't understood the, correctly the, the, the issue here. Uh, so I applied a fix up here to uh, adding an additional um, flag, which was the execution one, which then had it worked. So it was able to complete the emulation. Another additional support I added is was about PEZOR. PEZOR, another interesting PE packer. If you use it probably to obfuscate your payloads, it's, it, it implements another Shikata Ganai um, version. And this one had a specific fix up, the one I showed before about uh, adding the fake values in the stack. Then I recently added a new feature, which was, which is an anti debug one. Uh, in this case, uh, what happens is, uh, the emulation tries to find all the anti debug tricks used by ex the executable. What does it mean? Uh, sometimes you can have executable doing things to understand if they are in an emulated environment. And sometimes you may have, you may want to patch them, but sometimes it's not too easy to understand where they are doing these checks. And so I implemented this, uh, feature, uh, feature here. Uh, I know there are tons of anti debug tricks around, so I just implemented, I don't know, 20 of them right now, but probably I want to add more of, of them. These are examples of what is able to, uh, to detect. So for example, uh, the direct access of the, of these flags uh, and so on. What, uh, what, uh, uh, it happens is that once it, uh, detects this kind of, uh, um, uh, things, uh, it also tells you where it, it detects it in memory. So you can use your debugger to patch it and then uh, being able to use it uh, in a, also in a real environment without being, uh, uh hassled by all these checks. So this is a very, uh, at the beginning, this kind of things, because I implemented 20, uh, checks. Uh, there are hundreds of them. So we are, we are working on it. Uh, I show you a quick uh, sample of Fightworks. And here is a, here is an example. So it can just drop you where in the in memory, in, in the, where in the executable, the, the, the anti-debug tricks has been, the, has been identified and tells you which is the anti-debug tricks. So you can just Google it and maybe patch it out if you want to, to execute it. So, okay. I built the tools so that you can also customize it. Uh, how you can uh, modify a file. Uh, it's a Python script. This is a Python program. You can use Yara rules in this case. Uh, so there are a specific file where you can build your Yara rule, uh, to match code and then me being able to, uh, make your own rules to match what you are looking for. And there is another file here where you can actually decide what to do when the specific uh, rules you just uh, wrote is matched. And so here is where the, let's say, uh, interaction of the code parts comes in. So you can actually make the executable doing other things other than just the other, just what uh, it's trying to do. So you can guide it uh, to specific branches. Couple of words about performances. Performances are a concern. Emulation uh, slow down things. So no way around it on that. So, uh, also the additional fix ups and harnesses I added are, let's say, making it a bit more complex. Uh, I implemented a way to, to work around to this because I implemented a specific option, which is the Anuk option. And you can specify it and disable these, all these hooks uh, during execution until you reach a specific uh, memory location and that the uh, hooks can be re enabled again. So you can just speed up execution until you reach the point where you want to have a look into the code itself. Uh, now I would like to make you, uh, make some use cases with you in order to clarify why I think this is, this is useful in some cases. As I, as before, as I told before, this is not a script kiddie tool. It's something that, uh, you can use if you are used to reverse engineering. You can, you are used to incident response. This is a very interesting case, in my opinion, because this is where it started my idea about it. Uh, a couple of uh, years ago, more, um, something more than a year ago, I wrote this uh, analysis about an emoted sample, the last emoted sample before the shutdown. 
done in 2021. Uh, I had a look to it because it was implementing a really interesting uh, state machine in the in the code uh, with the code itself doing different things based on the content of a specific register. So what I was what I did in this analysis, I I tell you if you want if you have time have a look to it. It's very interesting. It was to use a let's say a very big a, a, a very simple version of Resploit to interact with the execution. So I was emulating the code and then in some places just modifying the content of this e of this register in order to get the code execution going in some other branches and, for example, discover what was creating a service, what was, uh, I don't know, uh, checking for the file systems and so on. This is a very interesting usage of the tool itself. I I'm very happy uh, to share this because it's uh, where the entire idea actually born. Then there are some other cases, use cases you can use for the tool for. For example, you can use it for dumping thread. Uh, there is a specific option in emulate uh, in the emulate command, which is the dash t. Uh, in this case, when it find a create thread uh, execution, it just dump it into a, a binary file. And you can analyze it later on. So it could be very useful. Okay. There is a demo, but we can skip it. So I will not keep you, uh, I know I will not waste your time, but uh, this another one. This one, it's very interesting. I added it, uh, um, a couple of weeks ago and the possibility to dump uh, memory allocation. This is very, very use useful because, uh, you know, when you analyze uh, malicious software, you always have the virtual alloc somewhere, then getting something from memory or from the resources and some from some something else putting them and the, and then try uh, starting in the crypting and writing the clear text uh, uh, in this allocation i wrote this uh, dash m option here which is actually allowing the executable to do it and it dumps uh, the content of the uh, allocated environment uh, allocated memory sorry only when it is accessed to be used or to be executed. So what it means is that by using this uh, functionality, you can, for example, no, this is the thread one, which is not the one you want to show you. It's uh, this one. So in this case, for example, there was a very simple things, uh, very simple executable, just decrypting something out of from a, a virtual alloc. Uh, in this case, I just enabled the dash M and I got this dump out of the the memory because it was the decrypted memory buffer here uh, with, uh, okay, this uh, secret password because it just dumped it when it was accessed back to be read. This is another way uh, which is very interesting to to get something out of of the tool itself okay let's go back dumping files it's more or less the same okay nothing special uh, another option to dump files created by the the tool but okay no no special things here uh, this one it's pretty interesting because this one uh, it comes out from the i don't know if you played the ctf teaser for the somniac uh, uh, there was a, re a really interesting uh, challenge, the coronavirus one, which was in some way probably created with OLLVM. OLLVM, it's an obfuscator. It's based on Silang. Probably most of you knows what, uh, what it is. Uh, uh, what it does is just gets a C, a C program and it do nasty things to the code, making them, making it pretty unreadable. This is, for example, uh, a flow of uh, an NLVM comp compiled binaries just doing a, a call to Google to get the page, the, the, the home page. As you can see, it's pretty modified. The coronavirus one uh, used during the, the, the CTF was uh, a lot, a lot wor worse than this. And it was really um, hard to, to look at. And how in this case emulation can, uh, can help you. It can allow you to, let's say, unroll all these things and let you focus on uh, the relevant parts. What I mean, for example, in this case, let's have a look. Okay, it just executes the things and what you can focus on are the API calls. For example, you, as I said before, 
that code was just doing a call to Google. And this is where it's actually doing it. It took two seconds to emulate. Uh, if you probably had a look to it with a debugger or with a, I don't know, your Ida or Ghidra or something, probably it would take maybe half an hour just to understand what is going on. Uh, why I was mentioning uh, the coronavirus uh, uh, challenge uh, of the teaser? Uh, because uh, it was one of the examples I, I made before, a very complex executable, which probably was not working out of the box, run, run in a resploit. But I, I switched my no idea what I'm doing uh, mode on that in when I was working on that. And so I tried to emulate it into Resploit. It was failing because missing uh, APIs and so on. So there were a lot of things uh, not, uh, not working well. But then I started to act in this way. I was looking at what was failing and there were a lot of API calls which were unknown. Also, the documentation on the internet on, on these API calls were more or less uh, useless. Uh, but what actually, in this case, uh, the emulator was uh, looking for was the definition of the API. So I started to add the API in Speakeasy, just returning a random value, zero or one. The only important things here is uh, the numbers of parameters. This is something that uh, uh, it's required because the, it needs to clean up the stack in the proper way. So if you define the random number of parameters, then you return a kind of a random value and you try, sometimes you can get the things working and uh, your emulation complete. Um, this is where, why I was saying before, sometimes the emulator itself needs some help. Uh, and this is how you can do it. Sometimes it requires a complete API uh, build uh, or, or, or uh, development. In this case, when I did it, for example, I did some of them. I pushed them on the Mandian Speakeasy repository. So um, I think that uh, I was, uh, uh, okay, I'm at the end. Next steps. Uh, it needs a lot of things to be done. Uh, improve emulation stability, improve performances, improve anti-debug coverage. Uh, we have a lot of things to add. We are at version 0.4 right now. It works. All what I showed today, it works. Uh, but uh, it probably needs a lot of other things to be added. I encourage you to go on GitHub, clone it, open issues, uh, try to get in touch with me. If you find it useful, I would be more than happy to work with you on that. Uh, uh, and so please do it. Uh, I would like to give uh, the credits to all the things I used uh, because it's quite important from my point of view. Uh, so Unicorn Speakeasy are the two pillars, CMD2, Sentinel-1 parser are other two important tools I used. Then Donut, uh, Pizor, and SGN are other tools I'm trying to emulate, which are very interesting. And also my traffic analysis site for um, providing the samples. So thanks to everyone. Thanks for everyone working on uh, open source software. Thanks to you for contributing and for being here today with me. Hope uh, it was interesting. And okay, if you have any question here. Thank you. Um, how's everyone? Uh, a question. Who was it? I, sh I sh saw a hand. No? Okay. Anyone else? Uh, ah, that there, I see. Hi, thanks for your presentation. Um, a small bit of a stupid question, probably, uh, for you. Um, Can you speak a bit louder? Um, probably a stupid question. When in the options, we could see that you can provide a PCAP file yep. um, when you would do the analysis for the, um, <clears throat> for the second stager. Um, because you're emulating the, 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 um, the payload, can't you just do a PCAP in the same time? 
Was there a technical reason uh, behind? No, it was actually not. There is no, it's not a stupid question. It's a good one. No, there are the the reason is that uh, since it's uh, built to be run also without the pickup, uh, it actually expect to have the payloads outside of it. But actually, it's a good point. That could be uh, a good announcement uh, to being able to extract the 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 binary itself from out from the the pickup the pickup fight. It's a good idea. To find it. Thank you. Anyone else? If no, we can thanks our speaker. Thank you. Thanks to you. Thank you again. <laughs>